this wedding horror story that ended very well. Story 1. When my parents got married, they decided to do something a bit unconventional. Instead of one spouse adopting the other's last name, they combined both their surnames into a hyphenated version and each legally changed their names. So my mom became mom dad's name mom's name and my dad became dad dad's name mom's name. When I was born, they passed that same hyphenated last name onto me. So I became daughter dad's name mom's name. Fast forward to last week when I was sitting in front of a clerk at the county office trying to file my marriage license. What should have been a straightforward process quickly turned into a bureaucratic nightmare. The clerk seemed genuinely confused by my name, and that confusion soon turned into suspicion. She first asked me for my maiden name, to which I replied, It's Dad's name, Mom's name. That's the name I was born with, after all. Apparently, that answer didn't sit well with her. She stared at me like I was trying to pull a fast one, asking, No, what's your real maiden name? I could see where this was going and I already knew it wasn't going to be fun trying to explain. That is my maiden name, I said, trying to stay patient. I was born with a double last name. It's on my birth certificate. But that didn't satisfy her. Next, she moved on to my dad. What's your father's real name? She asked, her tone suggesting she thought I was hiding something. I explained that my dad legally changed his last name when he married my mom. With the full force of the law behind him, he took her last name and added it to his own. That's what it says on my birth certificate. And that's what it says on his driver's license. The clerk frowned, clearly not liking that answer either. Then, as if to find some sort of flaw in my family's naming logic, she asked for my mother's maiden name. This time, she got what she was looking for. My mom actually did have a maiden name before she combined it with my dad's. I could tell the clerk was feeling a bit smug as she wrote it down. But then she seemed to realize that it didn't fix her problem. Now, on the form, my mother had a single last name, and my father had a double last name. That discrepancy clearly bothered her. She repeatedly stressed how important it was that all the information be correct, warning me in a tone that was borderline condescending. If any of this is incorrect, you won't be legally married, she cautioned, as if I didn't already understand the stakes. She went on to say they were actually going to check, emphasizing that point as if I was trying to slip something past her. The more she talked, the more stressed she seemed, to the point where I was half expecting her to break out in a sweat. Story 2. The bride was a picture of youthful beauty, barely 18 if I had to guess. She was one of those girls who looked like she stepped right out of a fairy tale, all wide-eyed and innocent. You could tell she had dreamed about this day for a long time. But as the minutes ticked by, something felt off. You know how you can sense when the vibe starts to shift? That happened as people began to whisper among themselves. The groom was nowhere to be found. At first, everyone thought it might just be cold feet or some last-minute nerves. Maybe he was pacing around somewhere, working up the courage to walk down the aisle. But then, Minutes turned into half an hour, and half an hour turned into an hour. It was clear that this wasn't just a case of pre-wedding jitters. The groom was flat out missing. The groom. The bride was completely devastated. I'll never forget the sight of her sitting in the hallway outside the ceremony room, surrounded by her parents, tears streaming down her face. Her mom kept trying to comfort her, holding her close, while her dad paced back and forth, looking like he was ready to punch a hole in the wall. They had no idea where the groom was, or why he hadn't shown up. It was heart-wrenching to watch. The wedding planner, trying to salvage something out of the day, decided to quietly move the guests from the ceremony hall to the reception area. So instead of witnessing a wedding, they were led into a room filled with food and drinks, which felt more like a wake than a celebration. The whole atmosphere was awkward and heavy, like everyone was just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I could see people throwing back drinks faster than usual, trying to ease the tension in the room. Then, just when everyone had pretty much resigned themselves to the fact that the wedding wasn't happening, the groom decided to show up. He walked in, hours late, like it was no big deal. The minister had already gone home, and most people were well on their way to getting drunk just to cope with the weirdness of it all. I don't know what excuse he gave, but whatever it was, it couldn't have been good enough. Despite everything, the bride, for reasons I still can't quite understand, seemed relieved to see him. They didn't get married that day. There was no minister to officiate, no vows exchanged, but they decided to go ahead with the reception, as if nothing was out of the order. We went through with the formal dances, and I tried to keep the mood as light as possible, playing upbeat songs to distract from the elephant in the room, but everyone knew. The bride and groom danced their first dance, but there was this undercurrent of unease that no amount of music could drown out. The whole thing felt like a surreal, bittersweet charade, like they were trying to convince themselves that everything was fine when it so clearly wasn't. Mikamp meant. Story 3. What we didn't know, however, was that the venue had double booked the space for two outdoor weddings scheduled at the same time. Ours and another wedding in a gazebo, not far from where we were set up. 
The other wedding seemed just as picturesque as ours, with their setup being a bit more traditional. Their procession was to be accompanied by a harpist, adding a delicate, almost ethereal touch to the ceremony. In contrast, ours was decidedly more boisterous. We had a bagpiper, as my groomsmen and I were decked out in kilts, honoring our Scottish heritage. I could already imagine the powerful notes of the bagpipes filling the air as we walked down the aisle. But as it turned out, not everyone was as enthusiastic about our musical choice. Somehow, the father of the bride from the other wedding caught wind of the fact that our processions were scheduled to happen simultaneously. He was polite when he approached me, but it was clear he had a bit of anxiety about how this was going to play out. He asked if we could possibly delay our procession by 20 minutes so that their harpist could be heard clearly during their ceremony without the overpowering sound of bagpipes drowning out the delicate melodies. I understood his concern. Harps and bagpipes don't exactly harmonize well from across the lawn. So after a quick chat with my soon-to-be wife, we agreed to the delay. 20 minutes wasn't going to make a huge difference to us, and it seemed like the considerate thing to do. What we didn't realize, and what the other bride's father apparently didn't either, was that the real issue wasn't with the procession timing, but rather with the timing of the vows. Their ceremony began and everything seemed to go smoothly for them. The harpist played beautifully, and from what I heard later, the whole procession was like something out of a storybook. But here's where things took a turn. When we finally began our procession, right on cue 20 minutes later, the bagpipes started up with all their majestic, booming glory. What we didn't anticipate was that their ceremony had just reached the most important part, the vows. It wasn't until later that day that I found out what had happened. One of my cousins, who was at our wedding, had a friend attending the other wedding. They relayed the story to us, and we couldn't help but cringe. As their minister reached the part where he was saying, Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to our bagpiper let loose. The sound of the pipes filled the air, drowning out everything else. Apparently, their vows were completely inaudible beneath the wall of sound. It was just bagpipes, bagpipes, and more bagpipes until our procession was over. I felt terrible about it. But by then, there was nothing we could do to change what had happened. I can only hope that the other wedding party managed to get some kind of compensation from the venue. After all, the venue knew exactly what musicians were booked for each wedding and should have realized that bagpipes and a harpist playing at the same time were a recipe for disaster. They didn't bother to inform either party about the potential clash, and it cost the other wedding some precious moments. As if that wasn't enough for one day, our wedding hit another snag during the reception. We had carefully chosen our husband and wife dance song, and our DJ had burned it onto a CD for the big moment. But when it came time for our dance, the CD wouldn't play. Something had gone wrong during the burning process, and our song was lost in the void. We were left standing on the dance floor, scrambling to pick another song on the fly. It was awkward, to say the least, but we managed to get through it with a laugh. Story 4 Cousin April's 1992 wedding is one of those family events that feels more like a fever dream than an actual memory. When I say it was a mess, I mean, it was the kind of wedding that people talk about in hushed tones at every family gathering for years after. And I can assure you, none of the stories are exaggerated. Let's start with the groom. The night before the wedding, he apparently formed a very close relationship with the stripper at his bachelor party. Now, I'm not saying that's entirely unusual, but he was proud of it. He bragged about it like it was a badge of honor, which, considering the circumstances, was already setting the tone for what was to come. Then, there was the venue. They chose a wedding chapel, which would have been fine, except for the fact that John Wayne Bobbitt Yes, that John Wayne Bobbitt was working there at the time. The groom was thrilled about this, as if getting married at the same place where a man infamous for being on the wrong end of a knife incident worked was some kind of weird honor. You could see the pride in his eyes, like he was telling everyone, I've really made it now. But that was just the beginning. On the way to the reception, the bride and groom decided to celebrate their union by snorting cocaine in the limo. And because one line is never enough, they continued to indulge in the bathrooms throughout the entire reception. Every time you turned around, they were sneaking off to get another hit, like it was some kind of romantic bonding activity. Meanwhile, the rest of the wedding guests weren't exactly models of decorum either. All of my husband's relatives got blind drunk, and that includes his grandparents, who, bless their hearts, probably shouldn't have been hitting the bottle that hard at their age. But who were we to judge? My husband and I were the only sober ones there, so it felt like we were watching a train wreck unfold in slow motion. And then there was cousin Lori. Lori, who apparently had a few too many drinks herself, decided that it would be a fantastic idea to request Closer by Nine Inch Nails. If you're familiar with the song, you'll know it's not exactly wedding appropriate. But Lori didn't care. She wanted to dance to I Want to Fudge You Like an Animal with My Husband, who is, mind you, her first cousin. I don't think I've ever seen my husband look so horrified in his life. We made sure to keep our distance after that. As the night went on, things only got wild. One of the relatives, no one's sure who, 
made off with all the table decorations. They just disappeared, and I can't help but imagine someone's house decked out with stolen wedding decor to this day. Meanwhile, all the kids under 10 decided that the best way to enjoy the reception was to start a food fight. There was cake smeared everywhere, food flying across the room, and not a single adult seemed to care. It was pure chaos. By the end of the night, the bride and groom weren't even thinking about their guests or the disaster that was their reception. They headed straight back to the bride's mother's house with the rest of the family, eager to do one thing, open the envelope stuffed with cash. They didn't give a damn about anything else. All they cared about was the money, and it showed. They just sat there, ripping open envelopes, completely oblivious to the disaster they'd left in their wake. Amazingly, this marriage actually lasted 10 years. I guess April eventually got tired of her husband's excuses for not coming home at night, which usually involved him claiming he was too tired to drive home. The whole thing finally fell apart, which was honestly a relief to everyone who knew them. Oh, and did I mention that April is a teacher? Yep, she teaches elementary school children. I can only hope she keeps her personal life far away from her professional one. Because if her wedding was any indication, she's got some stories that definitely aren't meant for young ears. Story 5. This just happened two days ago at my cousin's wedding, and it's still fresh in my mind because it was one of those moments that makes you shake your head in disbelief. To set the scene, my cousin and his fiancé had made a pretty straightforward request. No young children at the wedding. Personally, I think that's a reasonable request. Weddings can be long, and kids, especially babies, aren't exactly known for sitting quietly through ceremonies. Most of the guests were completely understanding, but there was one family member who just couldn't let it go. They insisted they had no one to watch their one-year-old, as if that somehow excused them from following the couple's wish. My cousin and his fiancé were polite but firm, explaining over and over that they really didn't want any children at the ceremony at the very least. It wasn't about being difficult, they just wanted to keep the event as peaceful and enjoyable as possible. But of course, this family member decided that the rules didn't apply to them. They showed up at the wedding with the baby in tow, completely ignoring the couple's wishes. I had a bad feeling as soon as I saw them walk in, but I tried to give them the benefit of the doubt, hoping that maybe, just maybe, the baby would stay quiet. Well, we didn't have to wait long to find out how that would go. The ceremony had barely started, maybe two minutes into a moment of respectful silence, when the baby started screaming, loudly, not just a little fussing, but full on, red faced, blood-curdling wails that echoed through the entire venue. You could feel the tension in the air as everyone shifted uncomfortably in their seats. The officiant paused, trying to maintain the flow of the ceremony, but it was impossible to ignore the shrieking. At least the parents had the decency to step outside with the baby when it became clear that he wasn't going to stop anytime soon. I thought that would be the end of it. A little hiccup, sure, but nothing we couldn't recover from. The ceremony continued, and for a few moments, it seemed like everything was back on track. But then, just when everyone started to relax, they brought the baby back in. I couldn't believe it. I don't know what made them think the baby would suddenly be fine, but they slipped back into their seats as if nothing had happened. Of course, not five minutes later, the baby started up again. Another round of screaming that shattered the fragile peace we had regained. This time, the crying was even worse. Like the baby was protesting, being dragged back into the ceremony. You could feel the entire crowd collectively cringe. People were glancing around, whispering and I could see my cousin and his bride struggling to keep their composure. They had planned every detail of this day, and now it was being overshadowed by something they had tried so hard to avoid. Eventually, the parents took the baby outside again, but the damage was done. The mood was shattered, and you could see the frustration and disappointment on my cousin's face. He's one of the most genuine, understanding people I know, and his bride is just as kind-hearted. They didn't deserve to have their ceremony disrupted like that especially when they had been so clear about their wishes from the start. Story 6. I was at my aunt's wedding, and it was one of those moments that you wish you could erase from your memory because of how painfully awkward it was. Everything had been set up beautifully. The guests were seated, the music started playing, and my aunt, looking absolutely radiant, began her walk down the aisle. It was one of those picture-perfect moments that everyone dreams about, until it wasn't. Just as she started her graceful walk toward her future husband, a phone rang. Not a quiet little beep or vibration but a full-blown, obnoxiously loud ringtone that echoed through the entire venue. At first, people tried to ignore it, thinking it would be a quick mistake, but the ringing just kept going. Heads turned, eyes started darting around the room, and you could feel the tension building as everyone silently pleaded for whoever owned the phone to turn it off. It didn't take long to figure out who the culprit was. All eyes zeroed in on my soon-to-be uncle's mother, my aunt's future mother-in-law, who was frantically fumbling through her purse, trying to locate the offending device. You could see the panic on her face as she dug through her bag, the ringing continuing without mercy. My aunt kept walking, 
but you could tell her focus had been completely shattered by the unwelcome noise. After what felt like an eternity, the mother-in-law finally managed to fish out the phone. Everyone expected her to hit the silence button and quickly stuff it back in her purse, maybe with a sheepish smile or an apologetic shrug. But no, she did something that left the entire crowd in stunned silence. She answered the call. Right there, in the middle of my aunt's grand entrance, she put the phone to her ear and started talking. It wasn't just a quick, I'll call you back, either. She had an actual conversation, chatting away as if she wasn't sitting in the middle of a wedding ceremony. You could feel the collective shock ripple through the guests. I glanced over at my aunt, who was still trying to make her way down the aisle with as much dignity as she could muster. But you could see the disbelief and hurt in her eyes. Here she was, on one of the most important days of her life, and her mother-in-law was casually yakking on the phone as if nothing important was happening. And this wasn't a quick conversation either. She kept talking for a good while, long enough that my aunt had nearly reached the altar by the time she finally hung up. The whole time, everyone just sat there, frozen, unsure of how to react. It was the kind of moment that felt like it lasted forever, even though it was probably only a few minutes in reality. My aunt managed to keep it together, but you could tell that the moment had been tainted. The beautiful, serene walk down the aisle that she had probably envisioned for months had turned into something awkward and uncomfortable. I could see my uncle-to-be standing at the altar, looking like he wanted to crawl under a rock and disappear. He knew his mother had just committed a major wedding faux pas, and there wasn't anything he could do to fix it. When the ceremony finally continued, everyone tried to pretend that nothing had happened, but the atmosphere had definitely changed. That phone call had cast a weird, uncomfortable shadow over the entire event, and it was something that people would talk about long after the wedding was over. Story 7 let me tell you about a little surprise we encountered at our wedding, courtesy of my husband's co-worker. We had a pretty clear idea of how we wanted our day to go, elegant, simple, and without too many disruptions. So, when my husband's co-worker asked if he could bring his two young daughters, we were a bit hesitant. They were about four and six years old, and while we hadn't planned for children at the ceremony, we also didn't want to be too rigid. The co-worker assured us that his girls had been to weddings before and would be on their best behavior so we decided to say yes. How much trouble could two little girls cause, right? Well, they show up, and let me tell you, these girls came dressed to impress. But it wasn't just any cute little outfits they had on. No, they were in full-on flower girl dresses. Not just any flower girl dresses, either. These were the dresses their parents had bought for their own wedding, which had apparently been canceled. The moment they walked in, you could tell they thought they were the stars of the show. They had this look in their eyes, like, we're ready for our big moment. Now, the thing is, we already had our own flower girl who had done her job beautifully earlier in the ceremony. But these two decided to take it upon themselves to fill that role for the rest of the day, whether we needed them to or not. At first, it was kind of cute. Two little girls in white dresses prancing around. But then, things started to get a bit out of hand. During our photo session, when we were supposed to be getting those perfect shots of just the two of us, they kept popping up out of nowhere. We'd be trying to capture a sweet, intimate moment, and suddenly one of them would be right there, grinning ear to ear, as if she was supposed to be in the picture. It was like playing a game of whack-a-mole. Just as soon as we managed to get one of them out of the shot, the other one would appear. At first, we tried to gently ask them to step aside, but they just weren't getting the hint. It got to the point where we had to outright ask them to leave the area so we could get some photos of just the two of us. Their parents didn't seem to mind at all. If anything, they seemed proud that their daughters were getting so much attention. Meanwhile, we were left trying to manage a pair of uninvited flower girls who had decided they were the stars of our wedding album. Throughout the day, guests kept coming up to us, asking who these adorable flower girls were. We had to explain over and over that, no, they weren't actually our flower girls. They just really wanted to be. It was awkward, to say the least. We hadn't planned on sharing the spotlight with anyone, let alone two kids who weren't even supposed to have a major role in the first place. Story 8. I didn't expect, though, was the kind of surprise that my mother had in store for us. You see, she had somehow managed to keep a massive secret from all of us, one that would leave us all stunned and scrambling to figure out how to handle the situation. The wedding and reception were both set in beautiful, but definitely not handicap-accessible locations. We'd chosen these spots because they had meaning for us, and they fit the kind of intimate, charming atmosphere we want. But as it turns out, they were also filled with stairs and narrow paths, definitely not ideal for anyone with mobility issues. As we were getting ready, I noticed that my mom wasn't around yet, but I didn't think too much of it. She was always a bit of a last-minute arrival, so I just assumed she was running late. Finally, word came that she had arrived. But instead of walking in, she was being carried up the stairs in a wheelchair. My heart sank as I tried to figure out what was going on. That's when it hit. My mother had never told us that she had undergone a double amputation. 
It was like the air had been sucked out of the room. How could she keep something like that from us? The shock was almost too much to process. Here was my mother, always the strong, stubborn woman who never wanted to burden anyone with her problems, showing up on what was supposed to be one of the happiest days of my life with a revelation so huge, it was hard to even wrap my head around. She hadn't said a word to any of us beforehand. No warnings, no heads up, nothing. My family and I were completely blindsided. And now, here she was, at a location that was anything but wheelchair-friendly, needing to be physically carried up the stairs by a couple of strong but unprepared relatives. The looks on everyone's faces were a mix of confusion, concern, and a little bit of anger. We were all just trying to figure out how in the world she could have kept this from us and why she hadn't told us before we planned the wedding in such an inaccessible place. Of course, we immediately tried to adjust. People were quick to offer help, and we managed to get her up the stairs and into the ceremony space. But I couldn't shake the feeling of disbelief and frustration. I wanted to be fully present in the moment, exchanging vows and celebrating with the people I love. But there was this huge, unexpected twist that kept gnawing at the back of my mind. The reception was even more of a challenge. Once again, she had to be carried this time down a long, narrow path and up another set of stairs. I could tell she was embarrassed, maybe even a little regretful for not telling us earlier, but that didn't make it any easy. There were so many things we could have done differently to accommodate her needs if we had only known. Despite everything, my mother put on a brave face, trying to focus on the celebration rather than the obvious challenges she was facing. She smiled through the awkwardness, laughed along with everyone else, and did her best to make the day about us not about her condition, but it was impossible to ignore what had happened. After the wedding, I finally got the chance to sit down with her and ask why she hadn't told us. Her response was classic mom. She didn't want to worry us, didn't want to be the reason we had to change our plans. She thought she could just push through it, like she had always done with everything else in her life. But this time, her decision to keep us in the dark had backfired in a way none of us could have predicted. Story 9. I was at a friend's wedding reception, and it was shaping up to be one of those nights where everyone was just having a good time, letting loose on the dance floor. The music was going, people were laughing, and it seemed like nothing could go wrong. But then, of course, something did. Something that no one could have seen coming. Among the guests was a different friend's kid, who was maybe five or six years old. You know how kids are at these events. Full of energy, getting into mischief while their parents are off somewhere else, assuming everything is fine. This kid had found himself a little hideout under one of the tables, while his parents were busy getting completely oblivious to what their son was up to. At first, no one really paid attention to the kid. He was just running around, laughing like kids do. But then things took a turn for the worse. Suddenly, the kid came barreling across the dance floor, weaving in and out of the guests who were trying to enjoy themselves. And that's when I saw it. He had something in his hand, something brown that at first glance looked like chocolate. Before anyone could react, this kid ran right up to the bride. This poor woman, who had been glowing with happiness just moments before and wiped whatever he was holding onto her beautiful white dress. The room seemed to freeze as she looked down in horror, realizing that this wasn't chocolate smeared across her gown. It was cow manure. Yes, that kid had somehow managed to get his hands on cow poop and was now gleefully spreading it around, thinking it was the funniest thing ever. The bride was absolutely mortified, and I don't blame her. It was like the air had been sucked out of the room. The music stopped, the dancing stopped, and everyone just stood there, stunned into silence. People began scrambling, trying to figure out how to help, but the damage was already done. The bride's pristine dress was ruined, and there was no quick fix for something like that. The kid, meanwhile, was still laughing, completely unaware of the chaos he had just unleashed. His parents were nowhere to be found. They were probably off in some corner, too drunk to even notice what had happened. It was one of those moments where you just can't believe what you're seeing. Here we were, trying to celebrate love and joy, and instead, we were dealing with a kid who thought it was a great idea to turn the dance floor into his own personal disaster zone. And it wasn't just the bride. He had wiped that stuff on other people too, though no one else got it as bad as she did. Story 10. One of my cousins, who had already been raising eyebrows earlier in the day, decided to stir up even more drama. This cousin of mine, who's always had a flair for the dramatic, was married herself, but that didn't stop her from getting involved with one of my groomsmen that night. Now, this wasn't just a simple case of bad judgment. She was under the impression that my groomsman was actually a relative of mine, like we were cousins or something. I have no idea how she got that idea in her head, but it was clear she thought there was some kind of family connection. The next morning, I ran into her and we started talking. I casually mentioned that the guy she'd hooked up with was a buddy of mine from college. I figured she knew this, but when I told her, I could see the disappointment wash over her face. She actually looked deflated, like she was genuinely bummed out that he wasn't some distant cousin or relative of mine. I mean, really? 
That's what you're worried about after cheating on your husband? This whole thing was especially interesting because she'd already been stirring up plenty of controversy earlier at my wedding shower. At that event, she was causing quite a bit of unease by sitting on my dad's lap and whispering things into his ear. Now, my dad is her uncle, so this was beyond inappropriate. I remember people exchanging looks and muttering under their breath, not quite sure what to make of her behavior. But because it didn't cross any obvious lines, we all tried to brush it off at the time. Still, it left everyone feeling pretty uncomfortable. Fast forward to the wedding night, and she managed to top even that. While her little fling with my groomsmen didn't ruin any of the actual wedding events, it certainly got people talking. The fact that she thought this guy was related to me somehow made it even more bizarre and unsettled. The whole situation was like something out of a soap opera, with family drama, inappropriate behavior, and a scandalous hookup all rolled into one. Story 11. You wouldn't believe the wedding I attended last summer. It was one of those days where everything that could go wrong did, and then some. The bride had this grand idea to have 14 attendants, each with their own unique song to walk down the aisle to. Sounds beautiful, right? Well, imagine sitting in an overcrowded church with over 100 extra guests packed in like sardines. And here's the kicker. It was July in Iowa, with the temperature hovering around 90 degrees, and the church's air conditioning broke down. To top it off, there wasn't a single window in the place. So we were all trapped in this sweltering oven of a church. The ceremony itself dragged on for nearly three hours. Why you ask? First, there were just too many people eager to recite poems, sing songs, or share whatever they felt was meaningful to the couple. And then there was the groom's brother. He was in charge of giving the wedding talk, but turned it into a long-winded blow-by-blow account of their entire childhood. I mean, the man went deep into the archives. Stories about them fighting over toys, breaking windows, and getting lost in the woods. It felt more like a drawn-out memoir than a wedding speech. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, we made it to the reception hall. The first thing that hit me was the blessed cool air. It was like stepping into heaven after the fiery pit of that church. The relief was palpable, but it was short-lived because dinner, which was supposed to start at 6 p.m., kept getting delayed. By 8.30, we were all starving, and I noticed the bride looking pale. She'd been so caught up in the ceremony and the endless stream of speeches, songs, and poems that she hadn't eaten anything all day. And then, right there in the middle of the reception, she fainted from sheer exhaustion and hunger. People rushed to her side, fanning her, offering water, and trying to revive her. All I could think was, why on earth didn't they serve the food first and save the speeches for later? It's a wedding, not a marathon of endurance. As if that wasn't enough, the night spiraled even further downhill. By the time the clock struck midnight, most people were ready to head home, but not before one final piece of drama unfolded. The best man and one of the groomsmen, both thoroughly drunk by this point, decided they both wanted the phone number of one of the 14 bridesmaids. They couldn't settle it like adults, of course, so they squared off right in the middle of the dance. Fists were flying, guests were screaming, and the DJ, bless his heart, tried to keep the music going to drown out the chaos. It was like a scene out of a bad movie. One of those moments where you just sit back and think, is this really happening? The fight was eventually broken up, but by then, the mood had soured beyond repair. The newlyweds tried to keep things light, but it was clear that the night had taken a turn they hadn't anticipated. Guests started trickling out, shaking their heads in disbelief at the spectacle they had just witnessed. Story 12. The server, a young woman who had been nothing but attentive and gracious all night, came through the doors carrying the pièce de résistance, a beautiful three-tier wedding cake. It was one of those picture-perfect moments the kind where you almost expect a spotlight to shine down on the cake as angelic music plays in the background. She walked carefully towards the center of the room, where everyone could get a good view. And then, just as she reached the middle, it happened. Her foot slipped. I swear, it was like watching a slow-motion scene in a movie. She went down hard, and the cake, that gorgeous three-tiered masterpiece, went down with her. Face first, she plummeted into the cake, and both hit the floor like a ton of bricks. At first, there was this awkward, stunned silence, quickly followed by a few chuckles. I mean, it was kind of funny at first, a bit of slapstick in the middle of a wedding reception. But then, as the laughter started to die down, we realized she wasn't moving. The room went dead. You could see the worry start to spread across everyone's faces. Was she hurt? Had she knocked herself out? A couple of guests rushed over to help her up. She was sore, no doubt, and clearly shaken, but thankfully, she wasn't seriously injured. The poor girl, though, her face was red and swollen, tears streaming down her cheeks as she started apologizing hysterically. She kept saying how sorry she was, over and over, even though everyone was trying to reassure her. The cake was ruined, sure, but all we really cared about was that she was okay. Fast forward a couple of hours. The wedding had moved past the cake incident, 
The restaurant staff, bless them, had whipped up some makeshift desserts, and the drinks were flowing freely. The server, though still visibly shaken, was back on her feet and doing her best to continue serve. But something incredible started to happen. You see, the guests at this wedding were mostly New Yorkers, and not just any New Yorkers. These were folks with deep pockets and a lot of heart. They had seen how hard this young woman had tried to make everything perfect, and now they felt terrible for her. And they were also, by this time, quite drunk. You know how alcohol has this way of loosening not just tongues, but also wallets. The tipping began. It started with one guest who slipped her a $100 bill with a sympathetic smile. Then another guest did the same, and another. Before long, it became a kind of impromptu charity drive, with everyone pitching in to make her night a little better. The hosting couple, the bride and groom, were the first to hand her an envelope stuffed with cash as a way of saying, don't worry about the cake, you're doing great, but it didn't stop there. I don't know exactly how much she ended up with by the end of the night, but I can tell you this. I threw in $100 myself, and I'm not exactly known for being generous, and I know for a fact that others were giving much more. If I had to guess, she probably walked away with at least $5,000 in tips from that night, maybe more. Story 13. Weddings in my family have always been a bit of a spectacle, but my brother's third wedding, well, that one was on a whole different level. You'd think by the third time around, he'd have everything down pat, but nope. We all showed up to the church, dressed to the nines, expecting a smooth, maybe even refined affair. The ceremony was supposed to start at 3 o'clock, and everyone was there except for the bride's father. We all waited, figuring he was just running a little late. But as the minutes ticked by, you could feel the tension in the air. The bride was getting antsy, the guests were whispering, and the clock kept ticking. Finally, about an hour later, the doors burst open, and in strolls the bride's father. But instead of the expected suit and tie, He's in a ratty old t-shirt and a pair of faded jeans. Not exactly the wedding attire you'd hope for. He marches straight down the aisle as if it's the most natural thing in the world. And before anyone can even react, he starts spouting off loudly about what he'd do to the bridesmaids if he had the chance. The whole room froze. You could see the bride turning crimson, half with embarrassment and half with fury. The groomsmen were trying to keep their cool, but the tension was thick enough to cut with a knife. But he wasn't done. He took one look at the groomsmen, who were all decked out in their sharp suits, and started hurling insults their way. Called them pretty boys, said they looked ridiculous for dressing up like that. You could see the groom, my brother, trying to keep it together. But it was a losing battle. The mood was tanking fast, and we hadn't even started the ceremony. As if things couldn't get any worse, the bride's father found the open bar during the reception. It didn't take long before he was completely stumbling around and making a mess of everything. The man could barely stand, let alone walk in a straight line. We were all just praying he'd leave before he did any more damage. Finally, he did stumble out of the venue, but not without a final act of recklessness. On his way out, he managed to wreck his car, straight into a ditch just down the road from the venue. No one was hurt, thank God but it was the kind of disaster you don't forget. The wedding ended with the bride in tears and my brother swearing he was done with weddings for good. But wait, there's another family wedding that stands out just as much, maybe even more. This one was my father's wedding, and the drama that went down still makes people shake their heads. My dad had finally found someone special after years of being single, and we were all genuinely happy for him. The bride was great, but her mother, a whole different story. She showed up to the wedding with a bottle of whiskey in her purse, and by the time the ceremony was supposed to start, she was already three sheets to the wind. Things started going off the rails when she decided to share her very loud, very unfiltered opinion that my dad wasn't good enough for her daughter. Right there in the middle of the ceremony, she started slurring her way through a rant about how my father didn't measure up, how he wasn't worthy of her precious daughter. You could see the bride mortified, but no one was really sure how to handle the situation. It was one of those moments where everyone just froze hoping it would somehow resolve itself, but it didn't. The bride's mother got more belligerent by the minute, until finally, enough was enough. A couple of relatives had to physically escort her out of the venue, and she was none too happy about it. You'd think that would be the end of it, but nope. As soon as she was outside, she decided to take her anger out on the limo parked out front, the one that was supposed to whisk the newlyweds away after the ceremony. With surprising agility for someone who could barely walk straight, she pulled out a knife and slashed the tires all four of them. By the time the dust settled, the limo was out of commission, and the bride's mother was hauled off, still cursing and screaming. Story 14. Now, before we walked out onto the stage, the bride's brother turns to me with this serious look on his face and says, and I got a fart so badly. I thought he was just making a joke to lighten the mood, so I laughed it off and told him, well, let her rip. I figured he was just kidding, trying to shake off some nerves, and that would be the end of it.
Fast forward about 10 minutes into what turned out to be a 45-minute ceremony. Everything is going smoothly, or so I thought. The couple is exchanging vows. The guests are watching with misty eyes, and then it happened. The bride's brother actually lets one rip. Now, he did it silently, like a pro. So there wasn't any immediate giveaway. But let me tell you, the aftermath was something else. At first, there was nothing. Just the usual quiet of a wedding ceremony, punctuated by the soft words of the vows and the occasional sniffle from the audience. Then, out of nowhere, I catch this whiff of something foul. It wasn't just bad. It was like something had crawled out of a swamp, died, and then decided to haunt the plate. But here's the thing. Thanks to the air conditioning in the church, the stench didn't just stay put. Oh no, it started to slowly drift down the line of groomsmen like a creeping fog in a horror movie. I was the first to notice it. And at first, I thought maybe it was just me that my imagination was running wild. But then I saw the groomsman next to me wrinkle his nose, his eyes widening in alarm. You could see it happening in real time. One by one, each groomsman got hit by this invisible cloud of doom. It was like watching dominoes fall, each one realizing a second too late what was happening. Some of the guys tried to keep a straight face, but you could see the discomfort, the subtle shifting of feet, the suppressed grimaces. The smell kept moving, relentless until finally it reached the groom. I saw the exact moment it hit him. His face twitched, his eyes darted around, probably trying to figure out what the hell was going on. He didn't say anything, of course. Couldn't exactly stop the wedding to address a rogue fart, but you could tell it was taking all his willpower not to react. Then it hit the priest. This poor guy is in the middle of blessing the couple, saying all these beautiful holy words when suddenly his face goes pale. His voice wavered for just a second, but he powered through it like a champ though I could see him subtly leaning back, trying to distance himself from the source of the stent. But the real kicker was the bride. She's standing there, smiling sweetly, looking up at her soon-to-be husband with all the love in the world when suddenly, bam, it hits her. Her smile falters. Her eyes start watering. And for a horrifying moment, I thought she might actually gag. She managed to keep it together, but I'll never forget the look on her face as she realized what was happening. It was a mix of horror, disbelief, and sheer determination not to let this ruin her moment. Somehow, we all made it through the rest of the ceremony without anyone breaking down or running for the exits. Afterward, when we were outside taking pictures, the bride's brother sheepishly admitted to the crime, and we all had a good laugh about it. I mean, what else could we do? It was the kind of thing that would probably go down in family history as a funny, if slightly gross, wedding memory. Story 15. The servers started coming out with plates, and that's when things took a turn for the worse. The first sign of trouble was the smell. It wasn't that mouth-watering aroma you'd expect. It was more like something had gone wrong in the kitchen. The plates were set in front of us, and I'll tell you, the food looked, well, questionable at best. Some sort of rubbery chicken, limp vegetables, and mashed potatoes that resembled glue more than anything edible. You could see the confusion spreading around the room as people stared at their plates, poking at the food with their forks, trying to figure out what exactly was going on. I took a bite, and let me tell you, it was bad. Like, how did this get served at a wedding? Bad. The chicken was dry, the vegetables were overcooked and flavorless, and the potatoes, oh, those potatoes were an abomination. I'm no food critic, but I know inedible when I taste it, and I wasn't alone. All around me, I saw people quietly setting their forks down, exchanging concerned glances, and whispering among themselves. The whole room was abuzz with murmurs of disappointment. You could feel the collective dread rising as everyone realized that this wasn't just a fluke. The entire meal was a disaster. The bride and groom were visibly upset. You could see them whispering frantically to each other, trying to figure out what to do. It's their big day, and the last thing they wanted was for the food to be the thing everyone remembered, and not in a good way. After a few more awkward minutes of people half-heartedly pushing food around their plates, the groom suddenly stood up, disappeared for a bit, and then came back with an announcement. Apparently, they'd made the decision to scrap the whole disastrous meal. The caterer had royally screwed up, and there was no salvaging it. So, in a move that no one saw coming, they decided to make up for it by ordering a massive amount of KFC. Yep, you heard that right. They called up the nearest KFC and placed an order big enough to feed a small army. The reception was about to take a hard left turn from fancy to finger-licking good. I'll never forget the moment when the KFC delivery arrived. Servers started bringing out bucket after bucket of fried chicken, along with all the classic sides. Coleslaw, biscuits, mashed potatoes, gravy. The guests were stunned. I mean, here we were, in this elegant reception hall, all dolled up in our best clothes. And now we were about to have a feast straight out of a fast food commercial. Some people were horrified, and I could see a few folks trying to maintain their dignity, picking at their coleslaw with pinkies up like they were still in a Michelin star restaurant. But me? I was thrilled. 
I mean, come on, who doesn't love some good old Colonel Sanders chicken? I grabbed a drumstick and dug in like it was the best thing I'd ever tasted. The mood in the room started to shift as people got over the initial shock. There was something about the absurdity of the situation that made it impossible not to laugh. The bride and groom, bless their hearts, decided to embrace the chaos, and pretty soon, everyone was getting into it. The fancy silverware was set aside, and people were diving into their meals with their hands laughing and joking like we were at a family picnic instead of a wedding reception. Story 16. One of the guests, an older gentleman who had been enjoying the night just like everyone else, suddenly collapsed on the dance floor. At first, people didn't realize what was going on. They thought maybe he'd just tripped or had a bit too much to drink. But as seconds ticked by and he didn't get up, the mood in the room shifted dramatically. My parents, who were watching from their table, described it as one of the most horrifying things they'd ever seen. A few guests rushed over to help, and it quickly became clear that this was serious. He wasn't just unconscious, he was having a heart attack. Panic set in as people scrambled to help. Someone called 911, and a couple of guests who knew CPR started working on him right there on the dance floor. My parents said it was traumatic watching the whole scene unfold. The desperate attempts to revive him, the sound of fists pounding on his chest in an effort to restart his heart, and then the grim reality that followed. Despite their best efforts, the man didn't make it. He passed away right there in the middle of what was supposed to be a joyous celebration. As if that wasn't bad enough, my parents also mentioned the awful, visceral details. How his bowels released as his body shut down. A grim reminder of how fragile life really is. The sight of it was enough to make even the strongest stomachs turn. And the room, which had been filled with laughter just moments before, was now heavy with shock and sorrow. But as everyone's attention was focused on the man who had just lost his life and the grief-stricken couple whose wedding day had been shattered, there was one person who seemed to be oblivious to the gravity of the situation, the mother of those kids who shouldn't have been there in the first place. While others were trying to process the tragedy that had just unfolded, she was more concerned with her children's reaction to the whole thing. Instead of quietly taking them outside or trying to comfort them, she made a scene insisting that everyone turn their concern toward her kids. She kept saying things like, My kids are going to be traumatized for life, and can someone do something about all this? As if the fact that a man had just died was secondary to her children's discomfort. It was a surreal and inappropriate response, to say the least. The other guests were too stunned and focused on the immediate tragedy to really react to her, but you could tell that everyone was thinking the same thing. This was not the time to make it about her or her kids. The real tragedy was the loss of life, and the fact that this couple's wedding day was forever marred by something so horrific. Eventually, paramedics arrived, but there was nothing they could do. The party was over, of course, and the guests left quietly, still in shock from what they had witnessed. My parents said it was the kind of event that stays with you for a long time. The sadness, the helplessness, the feeling of being a witness to something profoundly unsettling.